All right. So 5G. We'll talk about how it is defined, what is happening in the radio world, what is happening in the networking world, and, and uh, in particular in the networking world, we are talking about CRAN, SDN, NSD, MEC, etc., etc. So good thing is that at least there is a vision for 5G. They call it vision. So this is not the definition document. Similarly, when they did 4G, they had a vision document. Vision means they envision that this is what 5G will be like, and slowly, you know, they have to remove, reduce something, and see something, and finally, 4G requirements are set almost when the products are ready. Okay, so same thing for this one. 5G is called IMT 2020. So that means that it is international mobile telephony or whatever telecommunications in the year. 2020, which is four years from now. And uh, so there is a document which this picture is from, and this is a very good picture because it gives you everything about 4G. Okay, so let's read this picture. This says that this other, the, the lighter area here, the light color area in the middle is 4G. And this one specifies eight dimensions, eight requirements. Karen is specifying in a tabular form, they specified it in this in this form. And um, so eight requirements. So let's start with peak data rate. 4G gives you one gigabit max. 5G to give you 20 gigabit. Okay. Okay. All right, second thing is user experience data rate. So the user itself can get up to 10 megabits per second, and this has to be 100 megabits, 100 10x. Now, this is also user, by the way. This is per user. Peak data rate is not for all the users. This is per user, and this is per user too. But what happens is, even though LTE advance gives you 1 gigabit, you have never gotten 1 gigabit. Generally, depending upon the location, you will get different rates, and on the average, you will get 10 megabits. Okay, so this is this is the peak rate, and this is the, in some sense, an average over many different factors. Then, okay. spectrum efficiency. So, whatever is the spectrum efficiency of IMT Advanced, and these are many numbers, 3.6, which has been responsible we were discussing a minute ago. This has to at least improve by a factor of three. Now we need to improve the bit by a factor of twenty, so somewhere it has to come. There are only three things that can come by. What are those three things? Spectrum efficiency and cell size. I forgot that one. Cell size, right? So we are going to reduce the cell size, increase the spectrum, and increase the spectrum efficiency to get that factor of twenty. All right. Mobility has to go up. So this is a 350, it has to go up to 500 by factor of 1.4. Latency has to go up by, go down by factor of 10. So it is right now 10 milliseconds when somebody wants to transmit and the time they get to transmit is 10 milliseconds because each frame is one millisecond. It might take, you know, some frames before you can get your turn. 10 milliseconds, so it's 10 times you have to do better. Connection density. How many devices are connected? Right now, we see mostly phones, so we have about a million, sorry, 100,000, 10 to 5, it has to be a million. Okay, 10 times more, which actually might be under, I think, you know, if, if you take that, really, we have 100,000 right now for 4G, then we really need to go more, but anyway, it is 10x. Yeah. So, the actually Ten to one. I'm sorry. In for the latency. Yeah, for the can. For the can. Huh? Two times. Latency. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So actually, next slide defines little bit more, um, little bit more um, 
But in the same, it doesn't do any more anything what I, than what I already said. Um, so you are saying that in, for, in LTE advanced, we have two numbers. One was 10 milliseconds, one was 50. And I, I mean, I have to go back and see what 50 was for. Okay, but this one says 10. Okay, so but, but corresponding to that 10, we have to have one. Obviously, if it corresponds to 50, we'll have five. You know, but I have to do it. You had a question or? No, Okay, okay, okay. So that was how will CPU work to wake up. The thing is, if you were already transmitting, then you could get 10 years again. And if you were not transmitting, you just came on. And yeah, so that, that will take some time. So this is 10 to 1. 10, corresponding to 10, which is in a government active. And the second one was from. Um, yeah, whatever. So that that one requires a little bit more time for yourself to get up and to tell the network that you are up. Yeah. Okay. All right. Third thing is connection density. So this is basically how many devices, and the number of devices is going up very fast. I mean, I think the factor of ten is kind of underestimated and underestimated. And this is why by the time the really IMT 2020 document is written. And they will write it actually last time I think they wrote um, you know, maybe five or six or seven times. They just keep changing the number until the requirements match the achievement. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if they can't achieve it, there's no point in having a requirement. So, um, so right now it is 10 to 6. Network energy efficiency has to go up by 100x. We are spending too much electricity. Everybody is concerned about energy. Not only in the devices, of course, we are concerned about the devices, but also in the towers. So we need to improve by factor of 100. Area traffic capacity. So there are, this is the device number and this is the traffic number. So every meter, we should be able to do 10 megabits per second in every meter square. Okay. So so that one basically tells you that you know you could have very congested areas such as such as inside a wow. inside a mall inside a in train train metro train you know everybody just jam packed next to each other and with a cell phone talking on the cell phone watching something doing something those are very high density environments and so there you will need that okay so I think I covered all the eight metrics any question about any of those eight. If you don't have it, then I can probably skip the next slide. But let's just see. So the next slide basically goes into the text explanation of the same figure. And then in the text, it mentioned that you know it could be 10 gigabytes for mobiles and 20 gigabytes under certain conditions. So 20 gigabits is maximum. And um, so that is basically probably you're staying stationary and you know you have a tower or something, so you can get 20 megabits. You have antenna outside, so you can get 20 megabits. But you're moving with a tiny mobile, you might get 10. So the conditions can change. The US experience data rate, 100 megabit in the urban and suburban areas, but then 1 gigabit in hard spots. So what is a hard spot? Hard spot is, you know, like if they set up a, in a busy area like a tower and like a mall and other places we talked about, then you should be able to get 1 gigabit. Latency, we talked about that. Mobility, maximum speed at which the seamless handover in QS is guaranteed. So if you are going at 500 miles per hour, you should not use a phone call. That is the seamless handover. You can go from tower to tower to tower without losing your phone call. And QoS is guaranteed means your quality of the, of the voice is guaranteed. Connection density, we already know. In energy efficiency, bits per joule, no big deal. Spectrum efficiency, bits per head, and the traffic capacity to So I think those are all normal metrics. Okay. Any question about any of those eight metrics? No. And by the way, this document is very easy to read. It's not very long. It's 21 pp, 21 pages. And um, so you might just want to read that. The problem is that if you look for 5G requirements, you will get hundreds of documents. Every company has their own requirement document, which they are thinking, they are proposing. So if they are proposing to ITU, then they think that is the requirement. And so you can get confused. But this is the current. September 2015. This is the current ITU document. Okay, so at least this is true today, and this says dash zero. 
So this is the Giro's version of it. By the time the requirements are done in 2020, it will be nine seconds version. If these things keep changing. All right. This document also talks about which which requirements are important. And um, the importance is depends upon the application. So they have specified three applications. One is en enhanced mobile broadband. That is what we are doing with the cell phone today. With the cell phone, we are doing mobile broadband. Mobile because it is a mobile phone. Broadband because it is high speed network, right? And so enhanced, you have to make it even better. So if you have whatever with the cell phone you are doing, and so let's see that. So this area in the diagram is for cell phones, smartphones. On the smartphone, it is very important that your data rate be high, that you know, all of these numbers be high, but it is not so important that your um, connection density be high. Okay? Connection density be high, it can be less. Connection density high is required only for the third application, which is machine type communication, IoT. Okay, they call it M MPC, machine type communication, massive machine type communication. For that, connection density is high, high important. But for the cell phone, these other things are more important. Okay. Second application is ultra reliable and low latency. So there are applications which need high reliability and very low latency, generally related to safety. Okay, safety and real time. Okay, if if you have a bridge monitoring system or something which which can cause a disaster, there for those applications, and those are shown in yellow here, two important things are mobility and um, I guess I would not have cut off there, but anyway. And now the question is why mobility is, I think this ultra reliable low latency communication may be related to trains. Whether there is safety or something like that. So that's why they put mobility as a high importance. Okay. Yeah? Huh? Yeah, of course. So latency is the last one you yeah, hear. Yeah. Because it is low latency. Yeah, that's important. And the machine type communication, they don't care for any of the other metrics. Everything else is low except for energy efficiency is medium and the connection density is high. Okay, so now what we learned from this slide is basically that there are three types of applications, three categories of applications. There are many, but one is low throughput, high number, which is the machine type communication. Another one is high throughput. And that is mobile broadband, cell phone, and everything else in between. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. So the timeline. When is it going to happen? Now, basically, if, if you look at 1G, that's why 2G. 2G started in 1985, and it is called IMT 2000. It took 15 years. Okay. 3G. Sorry, 2G is, sorry, sorry, I, I may be off by 1G here. No, no, so the 4G actually started in 2000, so this is 3G. 3G started in 1985 and ended in 2000, so it took 15 years. 4G started in 2000 and ended in 2012, so I mean, basically the vision came out in 3. This is the vision document that we saw a minute ago. There was not the requirement document. So the vision document came out in 2003, and final basically happened in 2012. And now the deployment is going on of the IMT advance. Okay. And so similarly for 5G, the vision document has just come out in 2015 and right, September 2015. Right? And in five years you will have the final document and the deployment will begin in 2020. Right. So what you have to notice is that the things are getting faster from 15 to 9 to 5. Okay, this is this is a difficult thing for telecommunication companies to do because they deal with millions of things and they cannot just um, change overnight. So five years is a very short time for them. But they are, um, so so this is what is happening and then it might be even two years when we see six years, I don't know. I mean, I'm just saying basically the time is getting shorter, the technology is moving fast. 
And then when we say IMP 2020, that is the day it will start the farming. Okay. So by 2020, we will have the technology, we will have the equipment, we will be in, 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 in your hand. I mean, in some sense, right? Okay. This is why it's called IMP 2020. Yeah. Huh? What if it is late? Is it late for you? We just finished 4G, man. We just got the 4G phone this year. You got the 4G phone this year, right? Yes, I just explained that. that is, yeah, I mean, first of all, to design all this takes a lot of time, and I will go through this, you know, in this handout. Design takes a lot of Five years is very short time for them. I mean, of course, here thing again, you are thinking like a net head. Net, for net heads, every year the technology goes up by a factor of two. You know, every two, three years it goes up by a factor of ten. Right? So you don't know it, but we have 100 gigabit you know, in many places in the building, right? So 10, 1 to 10 to 100, you know, it just takes two, three years. But tell, bell heads, they take time. Okay? Huh? No. Yeah, yeah. So this is not because of because it is infrastructure. Thing is because it is infrastructure. That's why. All right. So now, what are they going to change? They are going to change several things. First of all, they are going to change the radio access technology. They are going to get some new spectrum. They are going to change how to share the spectrum with something which they don't own. And they are going to have some new networking technologies. And they will have enhancement to the previous techniques. Okay, so the small cells will become smaller. Self-organizing network we talked about. They will become more self-organizing. Machine type communication we haven't talked about, but that is module 18. Millimeter wave we talked about. They will use that. Backhaul will become better. Energy efficiency will become better. So, so what I have done is I have put two things here in bold and blue because those are the things that I'm going to talk about in more detail. The rest of it is enhancement. Okay, yeah. Okay, all right. So question is, what is machine type communication? So the module 18 that we skipped was all about machine type communication. Machine type communication simply means, means uh, IoT. Okay. So the, just like the, the uh, net heads are working on LoRa WAN and um, A11AH, the bell heads are working on LTE MTC, machine type communication, so that you can use LTE for IoT. Okay? And there's a whole module on it which will come to you if you have time. Okay? Any question about any of this? So the bottom part should be clear to you. I mean, I, I think it will not be worthwhile going through those six things in the bottom. Okay? All right, new radio technology. And there are so many new words there that have come up since OFDM. So remember, 2G was PDMA, 3G was PDMA, and after 3G they discovered OFDM, so the whole 4G is OFDMA. Now what after that? Right? Can we do something better than this? And this is I am doing this 5G because this is that the best of the world is going to come together. And so yes, there are different technologies that have been proposed, and this is a whole list here. Okay? And I will go through as many as we can. Okay? So right now this is just a list. So first of all, what is wrong with OFDM? If you want to improve it, first paragraph you write is that this OFDM is not good, and so here it is, what is not good about OFDM. First is that it's spectrum overflow. So when you send one subcarrier, the subcarrier goes forever. Right? It is not just related to that particular band, I mean, a particular frequency, it, it just keeps going, right? The oscillation that you see. And so if you are given, um, 20 megahertz, you probably use more than 20 megahertz. If you, so basically either use 18 out of 20 and then leave the rest for a little bit overflow or do something, right? So that is one problem. So you need the gas band. You need something that you cannot use at the end. And the entire band should use the same subcarrier spacing. 
So now here you cannot have 15 kilohertz between these two and 20 kilohertz between these two and 25 kilohertz between those two. Everybody has to be just exactly 15 kilohertz. Yeah. Okay. So that is a problem. It was never a problem so far, but now it is a problem because we know better. Okay. Second, third thing is entire time should use the same symbol size, entire time. So 1 upon x is the symbol size, remember? So if I give you 15 megahertz, 15 kilohertz, you divide that and you get what is the symbol size. And we use the same symbol size and same size equipment. Everybody has to use. Even if you are very far, even if you are very close, because you are part of the same cell, we have to use the same frequency spacing, same cell size, and everything else, right? And then we all have to be strictly time synchronized because if you transmit the symbol at this time and my time is starts now, you can be transmitting it now, you know. So we have to be very precise in time synchronization. Okay. So so we saw 10 years of OFBM. Now papers after papers are telling what is wrong with OFBM and what can we do. Any question about these four requirements? Uh, four problems, right? So the first solution is to do what they call spectrum filtered OFDM. F OFDM. So actually filtered OFDM. F OFDM. And it's very simple, easy to understand. And the understanding is that instead of using one OFDM over the whole band, why don't we divide the band into subbands? So this is like OFDM over OFDM. So previously we said OFDM is good because we divide the whole band into subcarriers. Now we divide the whole band into subband, and then we can use different parameters, different frequency spacing, different cell sizes, I mean different symbol sizes, whatever we need, right? So here I have shown an example where I this is the whole band available to us, but we do three subbands. The red one uses carrier spacing, which is 10 megahertz, and therefore it has some symbol size. And the second one uses 6 megahertz, and therefore has some different symbol size. And this one uses 15 megahertz, and the first one has different symbol size. And this is the time axis, this is the frequency axis. So you can see that in the same cell of the same frequency band, now we are going to have three OFDMA schemes. Now, depending upon where you are located, I can ask you to join the red, blue, or green. Right? And um, so so now each user will get the right OFDM parameters matched to their noise environment. If they're very far, you know, then they need big symbols, that means they need closer spacing. If they're very close, then they can do, you know, other spelling systems and so on and so forth. So basically, now there is one more thing which is happening is that since these bands are are independent, they don't want this band to overflow into that one. So you very really there is no guard band. So what is happening is they put a filter. So this red line here indicates a filter pattern. Everything outside of that is filtered out. Yeah. We need to have filters, yeah, soft filters. I mean, you know, all of these number of filters, right? So this is, that's why it's called filtered OFDM. Okay? Now, the band divided into multiple subbands. Each subband may use different OFDM parameters optimized for the application, right? So you can optimize the frequency spacing and cyclic prefix. By the way, you cannot optimize the symbol because if you, as soon as you selected the frequency spacing, you have selected the symbol size. But what you can select is one fourth of that symbol is cyclic prefix, or one eighth of that symbol is cyclic prefix, or one sixty fourth of that is cyclic prefix, depending upon how much delay spread you want to sustain with the reflection. Here, yeah, is that understand? Okay. So, so you can select the cyclic prefix, you can select the frequency spacing. Each the spectrum is filtered to provide inter subband interference, and that is why it's called a spectrum filter. Different users do not need to be time synchronized. So now, if you are in this band, blue band, you have nothing to do with the times of the red band. Of course, if you are going to share blue band with that person, then of course you have to be time synchronized, but not everybody in the world. I mean, I mean in the cell, not the world. Different users do not need to, so this is called asynchronous OFDM. 
asynchronous. The time is not synchronous. That's all. Okay? So this is called FOFDM. Any question about this? For every technique that I'm going to talk about, there are references in the bottom. And um, when the reading list comes, then you will know what else to read. But this is all I'm going to say about this technique. The next technique is called filtered bank multi-carrier, FBMC. Now, this one goes one step ahead and it applies the filter not to the sub-band, but applies the filter to every carrier. So this is one carrier. And it will filter out everything that is not in the main, this one. After that, all of these are filtered out. This thick blue line is the filter. So for the sub-band, we will need, let's say there are three sub-bands, we will need three filters. For this one, if there are 1024 sub-carriers, we will need 1024 filters. Right? So kind of difficult. But this is why it's called filtered bank. The bank means a group of filters. But once you have done that, now you can, um, so there's no side lobes, basically no cyclic prefix is needed. So what you have done is now because you are not going to get any reflections or whatever it is. So basically no side is needed. You can have more bits per hertz and different users can have different sub-bands with different parameters. Now, so we can combine this with the sub-band technology, which is before. So again, we have three sub-bands here. Red, blue, and it doesn't look like green, but we have three sub-bands with three different parameters and with uh, three different, um, basically, I mean, what it is is that now we don't need the band filter because every carrier is filtered, so we can the next week that. Yeah. Um, why doesn't all this stuff Because we didn't know this. These are all papers that are coming out in after the previous generation. 2011 is the first paper that appeared. No, no, it was theory was not there. All this is new theory. And it's still too costly to implement, by the way. I mean, that is being studied. The implementation is being studied. For example, you can see that this will be probably very costly to implement. So, right now, for academics, cost is not the key, right? Academics are just coming out with these ideas, and, and they are being you know, experimented with. Yeah, so this is not something that was known before. Yeah. And also, I know that designing the filter is really too hard. That's yeah, too hard, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, so, so the thing is, it doesn't take too much to write a paper on it, and these papers are there and people are discussing, but, but having said that, the list that is here, I think these are, these, this is not the whole list, basically. This is the list of things that people feel has some promise. Okay? So that's why they are talking about it. And there are hundreds of papers published on the wireless every year, and all of them are telling, you know, how they are better than the rest of the previous knowledge. Right? So, so that's the idea is that, you know, and basically this was not known. These are all very, very new. All right, so we now understand two filters, band filter and the sub-carrier filter, right? So then the next concept is NOMA, non-orthogonal multiple axis. So we had orthogonal before, and this is not orthogonal, okay? And somebody thought, why don't we, if we transmit two people at different power levels, and then by just by the power level, we know that this is for you or for you know, somebody else. So this is the idea, that this power is transmitting a red signal with a lower power level, same frequency, same time, okay? And a blue signal with a high power level. So the blue one has no problem. Blue one says, look, I am getting 10 watts and whatever number of watts and I, everything else is a noise and it can detect its signal, right? So the blue is happy. What about the red? Well, the idea for the red is that it will first 
try to listen to what blue has been given so it will really listen to the high power signal and then subtract that out to get what is what this what what is it for it uh, uh, what is there for it itself okay <laughs> Think about this: is that you are given a signal which is mostly not yours, but you take out everybody else's signal, just like they can take out, you can take out, and then subtract it out. Okay. So users with poor channel get higher power. Poor channel means either they are far away or they are you know somewhere where the noise is high. They they need to get higher power. And the users with higher power decode their signal, treating others as noise. They don't have to worry about it; they just decode it. Users with lower power subtract the higher power signal before decoding, so they really have to decode the other one and then subtract it out. Can also be used with beam farming and MIMO. So this second example on the right in place how you can do with the beam farming and MIMO. If you have beam farming, these two. Bottom users, red and blue, are getting one signal which is beam found in their direction, and these two are getting the same frequency, same time, another beam found signal, which is in that direction. So now you can serve four people. I mean, as shown in this example, you can serve four people with the same frequency, same time, right? And the people, and basically the signals are different in direction and amplitude. Right, in the same direction, the higher power is for the blue one, and the lower power is for the red one. So now they discover this one new dimension. There is space and time, uh, space and frequency, a uh, time and frequency, whatever, and there is a space for my own. So we have space, time, frequency, and now power. Fourth dimension. We are just trying to get more bits out of every hertz that we have. Okay. So can what do we mean by new memory? Okay. So all right. So normal. Well, PDMA pattern division multiple access. Now this is just a slight variation in normal than normal. Um, and um, and um, actually, I mean, um, maybe I I won't be able to answer how it's very different. But basically, in this case, what happens is that you get the signal, user one gets the signal, and it decodes its part, and then. Um, the, so user n will have to do all of this. User n will take the user one part, subtract it out, then user two is part, and then subtract it out, and then finally decode itself. Okay. User two will have to decode user one, and then get itself. And user one has to decode itself, right? So this is basically pattern division multiple access. It is a special variation of NOMA. I think in NOMA we didn't probably have the transfer function, but I have to verify that. But basically, what happens is you decode the same signal. And then you know the channel transfer function of UE1, and then you multiply it again and subtract it out. So this is the signal that is received from the air. This is the signal that you get, get pattern or whatever, and then you think that if I will transmit this, how much signal I will get and subtract that out. This is even more complicated than normal. Okay, this is like PDMA. Again, you see, this is October 2015. Just last, last quarter or something. You know, these are all very, very new things. And low density spreadings. And this is actually CDMA variation of CDMA. You know, what is spreading? We you know spread spectrum. What we did in CDMA was that we took one chip, one bit, and made it 11 chips. You know, or something like that, right? And then they send 11 chips with some coding. Well, here what you do is you you take a symbol and then you spread it, but not in bit, but on the subcarrier. So let's say I have some bits, 
I spread it. So I have two bits. I make eleven bits left, right? and then I put it on eleven subcarrier. Right? You also take your bit and put it on the same eleven subcarrier at the same time, and so on and so forth. So what the receiver will get is a mixture of many different signals on one subcarrier, right? And eleven subcarriers and whatever, right? And then because everybody's code is different, it will be able to figure out that I really want code one, so you use CDMA to figure it out, what is your data. And so they are mixing up the OFDMA concept of subcarriers with the CDMA concept of spreading. Okay? So instead of having chips being transmitted as they are in team, we are transmitting the chips. We are transmitting on subcarriers, and that's where they, that's where they get mixed up. And then the subcarriers, um, and then it is called low density because. So what we do is low density is because um, we don't just pack them up completely. So I mean, we we cannot. So basically, most of the time, the other users are zero. Okay, so you don't have to work too hard to get user one or two or three or four. You know, they're not all happening at almost at the same time. You know, most of the time they're zero, and and so the signal that comes through is is very low density in you know kind of collision or you know, mix up mix up. Okay, LDS. Any question about LDS? Basically, you have multiple carriers, just like in our DNA, where you have a spreading, you mapping, and whatever you have bits, a larger number of Bits in, in different subcarriers. Take that one step ahead, and that is called sparse code multiple access (SCMA). Again, combination of CDMA and OFDMA. Okay. Symbols are mapped to higher dimensional complex symbols, and then mapped to subcarriers. So this is slightly different than the LDS. LDS is a little bit older now. This is even. I mean, this is basically SCMA is what they're doing is they're taking the thing and they're doing to higher dimensional complex symbols. Complex, you know, complex is like your X plus I Y is complex, right? And higher dimensional. So even though you might have just two bits, you will take it to something that has four complex numbers. So this is four dimensional complex symbols, right? And then you map those on the subcarriers. So basically, each person when they do this spreading or coding or whatever you want to call it, they have a code book which has k dimensions. And I will show the example in the next slide, which has k dimensions, and of which n dimensions are zero. In every code book, n dimensions are zero, but different code books will have different n rows. So basically, suppose you take Four dimension, and it's out of four dimension. We'll just use two zeros and two non-zeros. All right. So I will select row one and two. She may select row three and four, and she may select row five. You know, sorry, one and four. The different four rows. Okay. But everybody has two zeros and four numbers. Four numbers out of which two are zero and two are non. Right. But their different positions will result in so much. So if you have k symbols and n zeros, you will have k c n four rows. Right, everybody understand the KCN part combination. KCN, no, that notation have you seen that before? Huh? You have seen it. Some people have seen it. So basically, when you worry about combinations and permutations, then we talk about this is a combination. There is a thing called permutation, and so the formula for KCN is. Factorial k divided by factorial n times factorial k minus n. Sorry, factorial k k minus n. This is equal to always and also written like this and also written as n equal to k c n. Now, has somebody seen like this so this is the common notation, and I just couldn't write that in in my PowerPoint. So I just use this older notation. Right? 
Let you see how many combinations are there when you need two rows out of four. Six combinations like that. Okay. All right. So this is four books. So multi-dimensional. So k-dimensions are spread over k sims. So now we need k sub areas. The codes are not orthogonal because now you have use up all the codes. Generally, when you do is combination, if you do want to orthogonal, then only some numbers of them are orthogonal. Orthogonal means then when you multiply them, they will result in zero. But let's say if I selected row one and four to be zero, and so two and three are non-zero, and she select row one and two to be non-zero, and row three is non-zero and non-zero. Product will not be non-zero. Product will not be zero. So we are not orthogonal because you are using almost all possible combinations, right? For orthogonal, we have to take only a small subset. So not orthogonal, but it is sparse. Why it is sparse? Because most of them are zero. Okay. And all codes in one code book are zero in the same location. So this is actually better understood by example. So I'm going to give you an example. I have two big symbols, and this is user one, and this is the code book for user one. It has two big symbols, B1 and B2, and the let's say the symbol that you want to transmit is one one. Right now, you understand? Now the code book has four entries: zero 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 one one zero one one. So it will take the last entry for one one. Right? Now there are four in each entry. There are four numbers, four complex numbers. But two of them are zero. Which them are zero? These two are zero. In all four entries, these two are zero for user one. Right, and these two are non-zero or no, zero, whatever. So this is the code book for user one. Because you are taking two symbols, two bits. That's why the four of these vertical sets, right? And two of them are, and then basically in the column four columns here, and among the columns, the two rows are zero, which in this case are the last two rows. Okay. Second user has this code book, which has similar properties, but which are the zero zero rows in here? Top two are zero, and this is zero zero. This is zero one one zero one one, and it is trying to transmit one zero, and therefore it will take the third column and transmit. Okay. The third user has this code book, and it has two zero rows, which are second and fourth. And then it has one zero to transmit. It will take the third column and transmit that part. They are all complex numbers, right? And so on and so forth. Six code books are possible because four C two is six. Can everybody calculate that four C two? Eight factorial four factorial two factorial two. Right? So, so that is six. So there are six code books, and we are using all possible. So now we can support six users. And four subcarriers, right? And so what will happen is what you will see on the air is a mixture of all these six things here. This is how it will look like. So this is the same time, same frequency, right? This is how it will look like. So this is called SCMA. Okay. Now, so the explanation is in the previous slide, and the example is on this slide. I think you should read, you know, both of them. Then you'll understand. Because if you don't have the example, it becomes too difficult to understand. Does it make sense? Huh? Oh, this is like CDMA. So as a receiver, the code division multiplexing is exactly that. That what happens is the receiver has the code book. So the user one receiver or the destination or whatever, I mean, basically has this code book, right? So if we get this and then somehow do some multiplication with that and figure out you know, what is it for, for itself, right? That was the CDMA. Okay. So so now you know, sub carrier is OFDMA and code book is CDMA, right? So we combine the Past two known techniques, we are coming up with a third new technique. All right. Um, 